Hi everyone, and today we're going to talk about Torsten Veblen as we continue our focus on uh, political economy theorists who've critiqued capitalism. So today we're going to look at Veblen's major theoretical contributions. And one of the things we should consider really early on is that Veblen is the first theory so far uh, that is mostly focused on consumption rather than production. So whether it's Smith, Ricardo, Malthus, uh, even Karl Marx, um, they've put their emphasis on the production side of the economy. So what gets produced and how and why and when. Um, we're going to see today that even though Veblen is interested in production a little bit, um, he's mostly focused on the consumption patterns of certain classes of people and people's ability to consume. So just to give you a quick bit of background on Veblen, uh, he was born in Wisconsin in the United States. Uh, now his family are immigrants from Norway to the United States who had no English language ability at all. Veblen spoke Norwegian as his first language and he first encounters the English language when he's interacting with his neighbors. Um, so despite this very difficult background, uh, what we can see is that Veblen's entire family so his brothers and sisters were academically successful. His sister is one of the first people to graduate from the university in the US who's a woman. Um, and his brother was a physics professor at Iowa State University, but neither of them will be as famous as Torsten Veblen is. Uh, now, the fact that he grew up around this Norwegian community, um, a lot of people have led this to say, well, having this outsider's view, having the ability to sit outside a culture and look at a culture kind of uh, with a critical lens um, was important to Veblen being able to construct the theory that he does in his book, The Theory of the Leisure Class, which we'll talk about in a minute. So why was he able to have such a unique perspective on American society? Maybe it's because of this unique childhood experience that he grew up in. So um, he eventually studies and goes to university and he gets a PhD from Yale University in sociology in 1884. And then after getting such a high level qualification, he finds himself unemployed for seven whole years. And what's the reason for his unemployment? Well, at the time, uh, most professors in the United States have strong religious orientations. And even to the extent where you needed to get a degree of some kind in religious studies or in divinity, they call it, uh, in order to be a professor. Um, now, Veblen was openly agnostic. And this is where he's saying, well, I'm not convinced that God exists, I can't say with any certainty whether it exists or not, right? Uh, so he's not an atheist where he says, I know for certain God doesn't exist, or I'm going to live according to the belief that God doesn't exist. But he was a doubter, and doubters weren't tolerated in US academia in the late 19th century. And so, you know, um, he eventually gets a position, uh, but he spends a lot of time out, out of academia, frozen out because of his religious beliefs. Um, unfortunately, when he does get his position, um, everybody absolutely hates his teaching. You know, his students notoriously said he was boring and dreadful and he wasn't a good teacher. Right? So he wasn't. Um, and you, you'll find this with some uh, professors who work in academia that they go on to become great and famous writers and they publish a lot of things and they make a big impact in the area of research, but they're not necessarily good teachers and you know Veblen it looks like was one of those people and he was also controversial for yet another reason which is that he had a super keen interest in women um, he was famous for having several not just one but several extramarital affairs and a lot of people have drawn a parallel here where um, well it looks like Veblen rejected social norms everybody expected him to be religious and he was agnostic everybody expected him to be a one woman man and he had many women Right. Um, so can we make a relationship here between his social theory, which is all about looking critically at social norms and looking at their historical establishment and looking at why that makes them strange in a way, the uniqueness of social norms and his rejection of social norms. So Veblen has been influenced by four big ways of thinking, and it's not really necessary for you to dig too deep into these, uh, but um, if we want to understand him, we need to understand that he's been influenced by a broad set of thought patterns. The first is the German historical school. Now, the German historical school, in summary, argues that individuals are not that important. 
right? So the efforts of individuals are not that important. What is important is big social patterns and social structures, right? So big patterns across a whole culture or a whole society or a whole nation or a whole class, right? That's what we need to be studying, not the decision-making of individual people. Secondly, Weber was influenced by Darwin's theory of evolution, uh, which basically argues that every single thing has a cause. Um, Darwin also argues that there's no divine reason by the world. And that's one of the things that made him controversial um, because you know most of the uh, accepted wisdom in Christianity or the Abrahamic religions, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, um, at the very least says uh, the, the word is caused by creation and it's caused with divine purpose. And Darwin's criticism was, uh, you know, this looks like a bunch of accidental stuff. You know, some things evolve because they're better at something and that's it. That's the cause. Uh, it's not because God made it. It's just because things evolve because they're stronger in some way or they have you some unique skill that enables them to survive. Now, if we follow Darwin, if we believe in that perspective on the world, that contradicts sharply with this idea of equilibrium. Right, Darwin's world is a world of constant conflict, constant chaos, constant struggle, where it's the survival of the fittest and that type of thing. Right, then Veblen was also influenced by the idea of pragmatism. So even though individuals aren't that important, he did believe that people have free will and they use this will to shape and influence the society. Um, in particular, human beings, when they're put together, tend to form culture and institutions. And we'll see that he has a fairly broad definition of what is an institution. Um, institutions for Veblen are more like social patterns or social laws or social norms. So not just physical institutions, but say like marriage is an institution. So a social habit or a social trend is an institution. And finally, Veblen was also influenced by Marxism. Now he's not a Marxist, um, but we can see the influence of Marxism on his theory, this idea of a small number of owners who are kind of parasitic. So they're not producing all that much value uh, and they're controlling everything. And the people who suffer as a result of this are the productive members of the society, right? So that's an aspect of Veblen's theory that he's drawn from Marxism. And the second aspect that he's drawn from Marxism is this idea that technology can cause social change. So the Marxists spent a lot of time talking about, as we learned in the previous topic, um, this idea that the development of productive forces can cause technological change and then can cause social change, can affect the relations of production. All right, so Veblen certainly talks about that and we'll see how he does that in a minute. So Veblen's way of thinking is often referred to as institutional political economy or institutional economics, right? Um, and how is it different from other ways of studying the economy? Well, as we've learned so far, most economists look at the economy as a static thing, so as a stable thing, um, something that's in equilibrium, so an economy is in order and in balance, and something that's separate from the politics and the society, so separate from the, uh, the human rivalry and interaction that we call politics, right? and separate from social norms and culture and things like that. Now, Veblen's going to argue the opposite. He's going to argue that the economy cannot exist without a society, it's embedded in our society. And therefore, these relationships between social and cultural institutions and the economy are crucial uh, because they shape the economic decisions that we're gonna make. They determine the way we think about the economy and the way we make economic decisions. And if we believe what he's saying, um, if it's true that there's a relationship, Veblen by extension says it's impossible to separate economics and the other social sciences. So we can't study the economy by itself. Economics is fundamentally flawed and we can't study it in, as a separate thing um, from the rest of the society. And therefore the other social sciences, if they produce knowledge about the way human beings are, that knowledge is very relevant for the way we understand economic decision-making. So Veblen's most famous book by far, and the one that put him on the map as a scholar and theorist is the theory of the ledger class. And this book broadly discusses the impact of social institutions on the economy. And its major focus is what we call the ledger class. So for Veblen, the ledger class is a group of unproductive consumers. You might remember back to Thomas Malthus, uh, where he said, well, the solution to overproduction is we create 
a bunch of unproductive consumers as a class, and they're going to help stabilize the economy. Well, um, for Veblen, this class of people already exists. Okay, and these people are going to set as their main objective to show everybody else just how much money they have. So the communication of status is their main objective. Okay, let's contrast that a little bit to Marx from the previous talk. Uh, for Marx, the point of capital is to expand as much as possible, right? To expand capital and continue the cycle of accumulation. For Veblen, the point of the leisure class is to tell everybody how much money we've got and to show that through the decisions that we make in purchasing terms. So here's a quote from the theory of the leisure class. In order to gain and to hold the esteem of men, it's not sufficient to merely possess wealth or power. The wealth or power must be put in evidence for esteem is awarded only on evidence. In other words, what's the point of being rich if you can't show the people that you're rich, right? For Veblen, uh, this is the way the leisure class thinks. It's not just about having the money. You've got to let everybody know you have the money. So then Veblen invents a term which we call conspicuous consumption, which is the way that people buy things in order to show everybody just how much money they have and just what their status in society is. So where is their social position, right? So the argument here is that many purchases um, have very little to do with use value. You know, remember that Marxist distinction between use value and exchange value. And Veblen will say, well, if we're looking specifically about what the item does, you know, we wear clothing. Uh, well, the, the very base level use value of clothing is to protect us from the elements, right? To make sure we don't freeze or get sunburned or whatever we wear clothing for, okay? Um, but is that really why we buy clothing? Well, Veblen's gonna say, no, the main reason we're gonna buy it is to communicate our status, right? And if that's the case, well, how important is this idea of rationality to our way of thinking about the economy? Are we really making rational decisions in the way that, you know, um, Adam Smith's invisible hand said we rationally allocate our resources or mainstream economics said we rationally allocate our resources. Are we really making rational decisions? On this basis, Veblen's gonna say, actually, there's a large part of the human psyche we need to be aware of, which is people make impulsive decisions or people make status communicating decisions or people make these types of decisions, which are not necessarily economically rational. We'll see what he means. So the consumer does this, the consumer makes these purchasing decisions to either gain or maintain social status. And then on top of this, an even more damaging pattern of behavior happens, which is where the lower classes see what's going on. They look up above at the people who are richer than them and who's got what, and they're like, oh no, those people have got so much status and power and wealth. I've got to emulate them. I can't just exist in misery. I've got to try and be like them a little bit, All right? So he's including in this a very broad range of behaviors. The obvious ones, luxury goods or services. You know, if you buy a luxury item, so like a super expensive car or something like that, or jewelry, um, that's communicating to everybody, I've got that much money to spend on a car or jewelry. Right? For Veblen, when a person has expensive jewelry, it's like they're saying, uh, you're showing everybody, I'm so rich, I can afford to spend money on something that actually has no real direct use value, you know. Um, so other examples, uh, charity and philanthropy. Now for Veblen, one of the reasons people give to charity or one of the reasons rich people become philanthropists, so they give to social causes, um, is to show everybody to attract attention basically. <laughs> so hey, look at somebody like Bill Gates or somebody like that who, who's going to donate a lot of their money um, to social causes and say, well, you're basically doing that to attract a lot of attention to yourself. You're showing everybody how successful you are over your life uh, by showing just how much like you're giving with a purpose. And finally, use of leisure time. So the reason like people, this leisure class, obviously leisure time. So how do we spend our free time and what do we spend our free time doing? So the way we use our leisure time can also communicate our status. You know, for example, uh, are we going on holiday, you know, down the street? Uh, in, a, in a tent camping, or are we going on holiday to another state or are we going on holiday to another country? And if we go on holiday to another country, are we going to a expensive country or a cheap country? You know, decisions like this um, communicate status. 
and for Veblen, that's the reason we use leisure time the way that we do most of the time. So um, importantly, all of this has a social impact, right? Um, there's, this is not just interesting in and of itself. And we can speak about this phenomenon as well. Well, isn't this interesting that human beings behave like this, right? But Veblen's point was more than that. He's like, well, as a result of these dynamics, there's going to be a social impact. If everybody's trying to show everyone how much money they have, there's a problem, right? The problem is the society is going to waste a lot of money and time. It could be so much more productive than what it is, right? And people could live so much better than what they do. But if we're trapped in this sort of circle uh, where we have to constantly communicate how much money and status we have, there's going to be a lot of waste, you know? And can we really afford to waste a lot in a society where, you know, lots of people go hungry, lots of people don't have very much, lots of people are poor, okay? That's the negative social impact. So Veblen's next concept is conspicuous leisure. So this is where the way that we don't work is just as important to his theory as the way that we perhaps consume things, right? So the way that we don't work is important. Our non-work displays our social status. And I mentioned just before that taking a holiday in a fancy place is a really good example of conspicuous leisure. You know, um, let's say, well, okay, I'm from Australia and in Australia, there's many beaches that are famous. Okay, and then there's, well, people go on holiday there and they just sit on the beach and then they go home. Okay, so um, that would be a fairly inexpensive holiday from the hometown where I grew up, Brisbane, you can drive for about an hour and a half, sit on the beach and then come back home again in an hour and a half, okay? An example of conspicuous leisure would be, let's say I get on a plane and fly to Fiji, uh, which is an island in the Pacific, in order to not participate in the culture, not see new things, not to meet new people, not to learn anything, but do exactly the same thing as I was going to do if I drove 90 minutes north, right? I could just sit on the beach and do nothing else. The difference is, I had to fly there, I had to get a visa, I had to go to another country, right? But what's the important part about my holiday to Fiji? It's an exotic destination, right? I'm communicating to everybody else. When I come back to work, they're like, oh, you know, you traveled so far, you went to that place. What was it like? You know, so conspicuous leisure is important for Veblen. Why? Mostly because this is what motivates the lower social classes to copy rich people instead of overthrow them. Now, remember the last topic we talked about Karl Marx and he's like, well, the inherent tensions of capitalism are going to motivate the working class to want to take the rich people and throw them out of power. Veblen is saying, actually, I'm not so optimistic about the working class throwing the rich people out of power. Actually, I think they're more likely to copy the rich people, right? Watch what the rich people are doing. And even if you can't do it exactly the same way, do as much as you can, right? So emulate the rich people. So Veblen's theory is talking about, well, where does this value of non-work, right? It, it happens in an evolutionary way, right? So traditionally, if you were part of the leisure class and what's an example of the leisure class? Well, the nobility were, if you were a king or a queen or part of the king's entourage of famous, important, noble people. Um, you didn't have to do manual labor. So here he's describing European society where there are serfs and nobility and that sort of thing. Right? So nobility doesn't have to do manual labor. The serfs do have to do manual labor. And what this establishes is a norm where if you don't do work, that's a way of indicating how important you are. Okay, if you dirty your hands by performing labor, that shows that you are lower on the level of social hierarchy than other people. Okay, so here, I mean, like we can argue that the nobility in the past at least did something. So they were given the responsibility of government, you know, the responsibility of statecraft. Um, the difference, he says, is that now that we're in a capitalist society, um, over time, certain classes of people who used to have at least some purpose don't have a purpose anymore. Okay, so uh, what good is a king or a queen today? You know, they don't seem to do anything. Okay, and this leisure class in general, his criticism of the leisure class is that they don't really contribute anything. Okay, um, included in this is the, the rules of etiquette. So for example, 
when we show how polite or refined we are to everybody else, that's going to be included in conspicuous leisure. You know, so when we're polite, Veblen's argument is like we're showing that we've got time to spend on communicating how sophisticated we are, communicating how polite we are, communicating how much time we've had to go to school and learn these special rules and norms of society, as opposed to the laboring class, which hasn't had the time to do that and behave in a sort of rough and ready way. Okay, so um, another concept that Veblen's noted for is the concept of Veblen goods. You know, so this is where people have taken his theories and applied them. Uh, Veblen didn't come up with a theory of Veblen goods, but it's based on this idea of Veblen's analysis of the economy. So in mainstream economics, we know that if the price of something goes up, that means there's going to be less demand for that good because this uh, fewer people can purchase that good, right? Increase in price equals lower demand. Now, a Veblen good is a special type of good where if the price of a good rises, actually that causes a rise in the demand of good um, because it conveys a luxury status, okay? Fashionable clothes is probably the perfect example of this um, where retailers are like, well, actually, um, there are certain types of retail brands that never ever put something on sale, right? Luxury brands. Um, where they never, never, ever discount anything, you know, because if they do, like for, for cheap brands, like putting something on sale is a guaranteed way that they're going to get more sales, right? Um, if they are trying to clear their stock before the next season stock comes in, great, let's, let's apply a discount, right? And then all the people are going to be like, well, that'll increase the demand for this good. So everybody's going to buy it and the goods will be consumed, okay? A Veblen good is never discounted because retailers actually find that increasing the price of this good increases the sales of it, right? So it's this opposite effect. Um, so where prices of certain goods, when they fall, actually worsen the desirability of the good. And we can measure this, right? That there are certain special commodities in our economy where if their price falls, they become less desirable. And what that really shows is that the only reason people are purchasing these things is to show how much they've paid for those things. Then we have this Veblenian dichotomy and Veblen mostly argued a dichotomy means something that's split into two. And so there's a distinction in Veblen's theory between institutions and technology and their impact on the economy. On the one hand, technology is an instrumental thing um, and its value is basically well, we value technology because it gives us greater control, hopefully, over the future um, than what we have now. So we have greater ability to control certain resources or predict certain things or speed up a process or anything, right? On the other hand, institutions are kind of um, even more important, I guess, to Veblen's theory, where these traditional or ceremonial behaviors um, really have nothing to do with this technological imperative. Like, why do we spend so much money on technology? Basically because of this idea of progress. What is progress uh, where we live a better life tomorrow than we do today? We have more control tomorrow than we do today, okay? Now for Veblen, institutions have nothing to do with the concept of progress, okay? Therefore, they have nothing to do with this technological imperative. So we can look at behaviors like, why do we do traditional gift giving? Why do we have ceremonies? Like when somebody dies, we have a funeral. You know, when people get married, we hold a big wedding celebration, okay? Um, these are institutions. So we're not doing these things in order to make progress. We're not doing these things in order to control the future. We're doing these things just because they're kind of like long formed habits, things that have evolved over time. So let's look deeply at Veblen's argument in the theory of the leisure class now. And he starts off in a similar way, a very similar way to Karl Marx's theory. And he says, well, human societies have evolved um, from primitive social structures that had no class distinctions and no established pattern of ownership. But at some point, human beings realize um, they're gonna create property and ownership rules for the first time. And this is kind of where the leisure class begins. Usually this class accumulates their wealth violently. Okay, kings and feudal landlords tend to be very violent people. At least they become rich by being violent. You know, they conquer some other people, or they establish their hold over the land um, violently initially. It doesn't mean they're always violent, but at least the initial seizure of property is violent, okay? And then they demonstrate their power and prestige 
through this non-productive activity? You know, why do people think the king is like, you know, your majesty and that sort of thing? Uh, because the king is constantly communicating how different they are from the rest of society, how different laws apply to them, you know, how they live differently, how they're, how they're different from the average person. Okay. So, uh, you know, I don't know if you ever watched the TV series, The Crown on Netflix, um, one that studies the British monarchy. And so one of the key um, historical events that happened in the British monarchy, which was controversial at the time, was um, the BBC's television cameras ended up giving you an inside look at uh, the way the British monarchy lived. You know, and a lot of the royal family's advisors were very worried about this because, uh, because it would reveal that they do ordinary things just like the rest of us do. Right? They sit around and watch TV or they, you know, go, go for a walk or they, you know, they do their hair or their makeup or they have a shower or they, any, any things that the rest of us normally do. And they'll worry that this would remove the mystery uh, from the royal family. Okay, so um, conquerors then gave themselves these high status occupations, war, hunting, government, philosophy, that sort of thing, okay? And the conquered people ended up with the low status occupations. So they'd be the ones doing the agricultural labor or the manufacturing or the construction work or the, the bad jobs, basically. So um, in previous societies, there was a dependency relationship between the lower classes and the upper classes. The lower classes needed the protection of the upper classes, probably from other upper class people, right? <laughs> so it's like, well, you, you, you pledge allegiance to a Lord because they're promising to protect you, right? To protect you from other lords. So you're sort of existing under a protectorate. Now, Veblen's argument then is that our current society, even though it's like, um, even though we're being capitalist now, right? we're in capitalism, but because we've evolved out of this early society, just because we're in capitalism now, doesn't mean the whole culture of the society now um, has been erased from the past. So we've retained many of the previous traits of the society. Um, what's an example of this? Well, occupations that are contributing nothing to the society um, get celebrated and occupations that contribute to the society are not very valued, right? So a lot of things that contribute a lot of value to our society, we don't think very much about them. We don't give them a lot of value, okay? Now I'm gonna go into some key chapters of the book um, and summarize them for you to give you an example of how his theory works. In chapter seven, he talks about dress as an expression of pecuniary culture, which is a fancy way of saying, um, the reason we wear clothes, like what we we're talking about before, the reason we wear clothes is not to protect ourselves from the cold or the hot or whatever. Clothes are about showing off, simply that, right? So even if the original purpose of clothing is to protect us from the environment, um, clothing is now about showing off, okay? Clothing is one of the easiest forms of conspicuous consumption to demonstrate and one of the most visible forms. And one of the cool things, I guess, about Babelin's theory is if we wanna test the theory, all we have to do is go outside and see the way people behave, right? Go outside and watch the way people dress. Or don't even go outside, go to your wardrobe, open the door, <laughs> look at yourself, look at the way you dress, okay? What are you trying to say by the things that you wear? What are you trying to tell everybody, okay? Um, so we use clothing to indicate our social position, to indicate our status in society, and to show people how much money we've got, all right? Um, the difference between branded things and non-branded things, okay? They perform the same function, okay? Uh, but if I remove the brand from something, you know, you would consider it massively less valuable. And then that's what Babylon is getting at is that the real reason we wear half of this stuff isn't because of the quality of it, it's because of what we are communicating to the rest of the society by wearing those things. Now, to make matters worse, Veblen will highlight that sometimes we wear extremely impractical things to do this. Okay, like I'm not wearing a tie today. Maybe I should have. Um, a tie is an example of a highly impractical thing. Okay, it serves no practical purpose. It just kind of sits there, right? Why do we have this culture of wearing ties? Well, wearing a tie is like communicating status that I'm part of this group of people that, you know, oh, that's how I dress. I can afford to wear impractical things. 
because that's how high up in the society I am, right? A working class person probably wouldn't wear a tie. Like if you're a manufacturing worker, you're probably not going to wear a tie to work because it's probably going to get stuck in something and get dragged into the machine or, you know, something like that. It's, and, and even if it's not going to do that, you probably think, well, this is impractical. It's just going to get in the way. I can't be bothered with this tie. Okay. So uh, we wear impractical things. Uh, women's clothes is, an, uh, is a much more obvious one. Like, okay, men, if we want to communicate our status by wearing impractical things, maybe we wear a tie, maybe we wear a watch. I don't know. A watch sort of has a practical purpose. So even that's pretty practical. Okay. Women have all number of impractical ways of communicating their status through clothing, if, if you think about it, okay? Um, not many of the things that we have evolved in any culture, really, uh, for women to wear are practical from a production-related standpoint, okay? It's usually for communicating how much money the person has. And this is Veblen's point about clothing. Next, in Chapter 8, uh, Veblen talks about um, the industrial exemption and conservatism. So here he's suggesting that, you know, we get our institutions from the past. So these are things that are fairly broad, social norms or political views or the culture that we're part of come from the past. They're long run institutions. So habits and patterns of behavior that have formed over a fairly long period of time. One of the ways the leisure class maintains their dominant position is by supporting these things. And these things are not necessarily rational, right? Uh, they're not necessarily rational. They're not necessarily about maximizing production, right? The leisure class maintains these things and supports these things, even though they seem outdated, even though they are limiting how much production can take place, um, even though they seem like they don't really have any logical basis. It doesn't matter. Why are they doing it? Because they're maintaining their position in the society they're maintaining their legitimacy, right? We're justifying our existence as the leisure class, um, you know, through reference to this politics or culture or social norms. Now for Veblen, this is why the leisure class tend to support the ideology which we call conservatism, right? So they tend to be politically conservative. Um, they want to defend old customs, cultures, institutions as being valuable, important because their existence is based on these institutions. You know, without these institutions, they don't mean anything as a social group, right? So there's a tendency for the leisure class to be conservative and to support conservatism. In chapter nine, he spends an entire chapter talking, sorry, chapter 11, talking about luck. And um, the most obvious expression of luck is gambling. So when we gamble money, what does that tell the people around us? Well, for Veblen, that's saying, I've got so much money, I can afford to just basically waste this money and let chance determine whether I become richer or poorer, right? It's a simultaneous display of both conspicuous consumption and conspicuous leisure. You know, not only have I got money to waste, I've got time to waste on this money wasting exercise. So gambling is a true zero sum game. You know, we're not creating any new value. Um, we're just taking existing value and we're making a bet and one side's going to win and another side's going to lose. You know, so the winner gets everything and the loser gets nothing. It's a zero sum game. Now, what's interesting in terms of its application is that gambling is more widespread than we realize in terms of the modern economic system. Modern finance is basically gambling. All right, so you'll hear stock traders referring to making a bet on stocks or shares um, in terms of their position improving or getting worse. Okay, and when a person gambles on shares, price going up, um, no new value is actually being created. You know, um, some people will win that bet and some people will lose that bet. You know, so modern finance is essentially like gambling. And to this extent, like Veblen is sort of highlighting the connection between luck and a major part of our economic system. You know, modern, the financial system is a huge part of the way our economy works today. And then in chapter 13, we'll see that Veblen talks about the survival of the non invidious interests. So Veblen says, well, if we look at most of our history, there are certain types of people for whom it's just not good if they work, right? We just don't think it's good. We study people's behavior and it's like, well, for example, it was seen as morally unacceptable for religious leaders to perform work you know, in, in most cultures. And from the perspective of women, 
undesirable for women to work. So families indicate the status of their household. Um, like one of the major ways they indicate this is by whether the woman has to quote work or not. You know, so um, if the woman has to work, that's like, oh no, she has to be involved in productive activity. Oh, that's an insult to our reputation. You know, so um, now a capitalist reading of this situation is, well, it's good if the woman works, we need to maximize our production as much as possible. Uh, and if we're economically rational, we want to fully allocate our resources and get the best economic return for it. Now, Veblen's point is we don't actually think like that. Um, a lot of people don't want their woman to work. <laughs> You know, don't want the, the women in their families to work because they want to tell everybody, you know, look how rich we are, um, our women don't have to work. And on top of that, the way that women spend their time is also seen as important in communicating their status. So is the woman working or not? If they're not working, what are they spending their time doing? Are they doing homework? You know, uh, maybe that's slightly better. But what's even better than that is if they're at home not doing homework, at home having other people do the homework for them, um, at home basically beautifying themselves or that sort of thing, right? Because that indicates to everybody else that they've got time and money to spend on that activity. So women have played a very important role in communicating status, both as subjects and objects of conspicuous consumption and conspicuous leisure. Buy some jewelry, stick it on a woman, everybody knows you've got money to buy that jewelry. You know, um, send a woman to a, I don't know, a beauty parlor or a spa day or a kitty party or anything like that. Um, and it's indicating to everybody, not only that she doesn't have to work during the day, but she can afford to spend money on leisure, right? So um, there's a phenomenon which we call the feminization U-curve, uh, which is basically measures uh, what percentage of people, of women are in productive employment um, based on their social position. And what we see is that poor people and rich people both um, have higher levels of female labor force participation. Now, okay, what's interesting though is that middle class people have low levels of female labor force participation. <laughs> and the reason for this is that the middle class is kind of the most conspicuous consuming, conspicuous leisure participating class in existence. You know, they're the ones who, well, they've got enough money that they don't have to do something, but not so much money that they can break free from these social traditions. Okay, so um, they're the ones demonstrating exactly this, that they're communicating how important they are as a rising class by showing people what they don't have to do. In chapter 14, um, we talk about uh, higher education. And here's where I'm kind of shooting myself in the foot because I'm in the higher education industry, okay? So Veblen provides a critique of the modern university and says, let's compare two institutions that look like they do a fairly similar thing, okay? University and polytechnical education. Now at the university, we're learning somewhat about abstract subject, subjects, not always, but polytechnical colleges always teach practical skills. Now, universities are considered high prestige institutions. Polytechnical colleges are not considered high prestige institutions. And what's important about this is actually the skills that they teach generate significant value. You know, there's ways of measuring this as like per unit of investment in polytechnical education, um, how much is production expanded and stuff, or how much value does the economy generate as a result of that. Um, now, the truth is, the hard truth is, if, you, if you're a government, and you want to invest money in your nation's productivity, you should be investing that money in polytechnical colleges. They're much more productive institutions. Universities are far less productive per dollar invested than polytechnical colleges are, right? But why do we go to university then, right? And what's the deal? Well, Veblen is going to argue the reason people study degrees is just for the status, right? We want to go to university not necessarily to learn. And I'm not accusing you of this, like maybe you're here for the right reasons, right? Maybe you're here to learn, maybe you're here to get knowledge, um, but maybe you're here so that you can later on tell everybody you went to university, right? Um, and when Veblen looks at the university, he's not seeing the knowledge generation. He's not seeing the knowledge transmission. He's not seeing the research. He's looking at, a series of ceremonial symbols. Like we, when we graduate, you dress up in a fancy uniform and you get given Sorry, a degree and there's all these ceremonies taking place. Could you please repeat it? 
Oops, Siri's talking to me. Yeah, so <laughs> um, when we dress up like this, we're communicating our status. Like when we graduate and we wear robes, we're communicating our status that we're somehow, you know, raised above the general population. And for Veblen, this indicates it's a leisure class institution. The fact that I have a phone that has Siri on it, I suppose, is, is a leisure, leisure class institution, right? I'm communicating by buying an Apple phone that I've got money to spend on it over and above a regular phone. You know, um, all of these, so basically everything that we do, not everything, but there's a lot of things that we do that we're just doing for the status. You know, we're not doing it for the use value. We're doing it to show people how successful we are or how much money we've got or how much we don't have to work. So now that we've seen into, looked into Veblen's theory, let's briefly compare him with Marx. So we know that they both don't think capitalism is a great economic system, right? That's something they share, but what's different? Well, we've seen that Marxist theory has a production focus, okay? Um, Marx and all of the Marxists after Marx have mostly focused on production as an exchange as being the key points of the economy that we should focus on. Surplus value is extracted from workers and that's what makes workers you know, revolutionary in the process of production itself. On the other hand, we've seen that Veblen's theory is focused on consumption and the division of labor that's created by different consumption patterns between this leisure class that consumes and doesn't produce right, and everybody else who sort of can't consume the same things but tries to copy them, All right, so they set the standard and then everybody else copies them. Next, we see the labor theory of value. So Veblen, unlike Marx, doesn't accept the labor theory of value, All right? The labor theory of value is obviously very important in Marxist analysis. Um, Veblen was a strong believer that as time went by, technology was gonna become much more important than people, right? And that um, that would be an important part of the way technological change would influence our society. And then we have the concept of revolutionary change. So Marx obviously believed that even at his time was a revolutionary time, that the working class by participating in this capitalist production were going to become radicalized and were gonna really want to overthrow the capitalist system. And it was the job of the revolutionary leader to sort of encourage the working class to overthrow the capitalist system. You know, and that this was a, he predicted it was likely to happen, you know, soon. Okay, now Veblen is a bit of a pessimist when it comes to social change. He's like, well, uh, from what I've studied, the lower classes aren't going to try and overthrow the capitalist system. Um, instead, they're going to try and copy the higher classes, right? So maybe they can't afford a Gucci bag. Maybe they can afford an imitation Gucci bag. <laughs> And then, then they're going to copy and imitate the, the higher class instead of thinking they're the enemy and overthrow them. They're content just trying to be like them, right? Or getting just a little bit of leisure or getting just a little bit of conspicuous consumption or having one excessive bag instead of having 10. So um, the leisure class is going to corrupt the working class rather than get, over, like get, get overthrown by the working class. And that's a difference in their outlook. But there's many similarities between Veblen and Marx as well, right? One, the historical focus. So both Veblen and Marx look at capitalism, not just as it exists now, but where did it come from, right? Uh, it's important to understand the historical development of capitalism if you want to understand where it's likely to go, right? How did capitalism come to exist as a social system is a really important question, um, especially from the perspective of both Veblen and Marx. Next. They were both highly critical of exploitation. Okay, Veblen and Marx in both theories strongly believe there's this unproductive upper class which is exploiting the working class. All right, they might disagree about what's going to happen. You know, Marx believes revolution is going to happen. Veblen believes social decay is going to happen. But they both believe that this unproductive upper class is exploiting the working class. And then um, both Veblen and Marx have a negative view about the consequences of competition. You know, both of them believe that it's going to lead to waste and monopoly capitalism, right? Uh, as uh, important consequences of, of what capitalism is. So um, then Veblen produces his book. Um, he gets criticized heavily by people in the United States, particularly by the intellectual class and also by the middle class. Okay, so 
Um, here's an example. So he gets reviewed in the book, in the, the magazine Vanity Fair. And he says, the doctors made one big mistake. However, he's presupposed in writing this book, the existence of a class which much more leisure than any class in the world has ever possessed. For has he not counted on a certain number of readers? In other words, uh, Benchley, who wrote this, wrote this comment, is saying, you know, you're publishing a book and who reads books? The leisure class reads books, but you published a book that criticizes them. Nobody's going to buy your book. Everybody's going to hate you. You know, uh, you're not going to find many readers. Okay, so the irony of this criticism is that Benchley is not attacking Veblen's argument. He's not saying, I think you're wrong. I think you're wrong about what you're saying. You know, I think you're not being fair. You're not accurate. What you're saying, I disagree with. Rather, he's saying, well, the problem with you, Veblen, is you're not thinking of the productive, you know, the, the possibility. You're not thinking of the market. You know, um, you're not thinking of what's going to sell the most books. You're not trying to be a bestseller. You know, what would appeal to most intellectual readers? So Veblen's theories remain controversial, but they get some support in some subsequent studies. And most of these studies look at, you know, um, have looked at the behavior of working class people in rich countries. So an example is in Middletown, a study in modern American culture, and then Middletown in transition, a study in cultural conflicts. In both of these books, the authors of the books basically looked at behavioral patterns in the working class. And the finding that they came up with is pretty interesting. What it shows is that working class families in these case studies um, would sacrifice on things like necessities. So they would buy less food or they'd buy cheaper quality food or they'd buy less clothing or cheaper quality clothing as long as they could appear to be part of a higher class, right? As long as they could purchase things that made them, that gave them the appearance of being part of a higher class, you know, like um, they might have a shinier house or a car or, you know, things like that, send their kids to the right school, whatever. But they would sacrifice necessities in order to communicate that they were part of a higher social class than they actually were, right? And if that's the truth, that's really interesting as a commentary on human behavior, right? It really highlights just how vulnerable we are to this sort of social pressure. On the other hand, Veblen gets praised from a fairly strange place. And Warren Buffett is famous for making lots of money as a business person, as an entrepreneur, right? Particularly in the financial system. And he said about Veblen that his theories have been proven correct by the modern financial system. So why is it that things like finance that produce absolutely nothing, right? We speculate on buying and selling of shares and securities and manipulating differences in price. That's basically what the stock market is, right? A totally unproductive activity. How does this totally unproductive activity dominate the world economy, even though it produces absolutely nothing of use? Now, Buffett ends up concluding, despite being a businessman, despite being a businessman involved in finance, his argument is that the US capitalist class are generally an unproductive class, right? They have limited social utility. There's nothing that they're doing that's that special. They just kind of parasitically exist and suck the life out of everybody else. So if we are convinced by Veblen, and maybe some of you are convinced by Veblen, um, if he's right, then when we create theories of economic behavior, if we base these theories on the idea that human beings are rational decision makers, um, we are wrong. Right, because nothing that I've just talked about for the last little while is particularly economically rational. These are vain people, narcissistic people, maybe people who are really worried about the way others see them. Perception is more important than reality. Okay, this is not economic rationality. All right, so why, Veblen will ask, why do we base so many of our economic theories on economic rationality if we can show that people are not? even if they're economically rational sometimes, that they're not always economically rational. Okay, now, even Marx argued that capitalism was a historically progressive system, that it was better than all the previous social systems, right? That it's a force for progress up to a point, right? Marx obviously argued we needed to get to socialism and communism, but he said about capitalism that this is at least better than all the previous systems and it enables our progress in a lot of ways. Veblen, on the other hand, has a much more pessimistic conclusion. He's arguing that 
capitalism is at its core a fundamentally irrational system, right? It reflects our deepest and most unpleasant impulses and therefore it generates a number of negative outcomes as well. So one of the big problems with Veblen, like that Veblen's identified is this concept of social status. Now, if capitalism is all about people's drive to seek a higher status, there's a big issue here because status is a zero sum game as well, right? There is no win-win in status. We cannot all rise our social status, right? Social status goes up because you're above somebody that you previously went above, right? There has to be somebody going up and somebody going down. We can only become higher up if another person becomes lower down. That's how status works. Status means having more money, more stuff, more prestige than other people. And so a status seeking society is a bit of a dangerous society because it's this ruthless game of competition. Everybody's trying to beat each other, you know, and this is not necessarily going to construct a happy society or a harmonious society or a society that can work together for common success. Okay. So what we call status anxiety is when a person is scared that they're going to fall down in their social position. So you think you're here and you're going to fall down to here. If you don't try hard enough, we're worried about being overtaken by people around us, that somebody who was worse than us today is gonna to maybe become better than us tomorrow, okay? So Veblen's really worried that the society is defined by this status anxiety where everybody's constantly panicking about who's getting ahead of us. And that's gonna lead us down this path of making extremely irrational decisions about the way that we spend our money. Um, I'm not sure if you pay attention to classic rock music, but I've listed Bob Dylan's Like a Rolling Stone here. And it's one of the, um, more impactful songs of the 20th century because I uh, to to explain like uh, recording artists at the time used to make like two minute songs or that sort of thing you know because it was easy to fit that into a radio slot and easy to get publicity now like a rolling stone is about a six minute song right so it was a long song and that wasn't commercially viable until Bob Dylan made this song and the story of the song is basically about a rich woman who loses her social position. So she was rich and she becomes poor. And Dylan has a bunch of lines in the song that sort of mocks in a way, the fact that she you know, used to have this status and now it's gone. So he says, once upon a time, you dressed so fine through the bums of dime in your prime, didn't you? He's talking about what Babelin talked about. She's using charity to communicate her position of power. Hey, look beggars, I'm the rich person who gives and therefore I'm better than you, I condescend to give you some money, right? That shows me that I'm higher up, that shows you that you're lower down. That's the relationship. Charity is about status. And then in the, the situation where she's fallen down, he says, now you don't talk so loud, now you don't seem so proud about having to be scrounging your next meal. So the woman's obviously in a situation where uh, she's now struggling to meet basic necessities. You know, and the song goes on to talk about, well, you know, she used to be the person who looked down at others and now, haha, ha, she's the one who's getting looked down upon by everybody. If you want to check out the song, I've provided a link to it there. You can just Google it as well. So what's wrong with this uh, conspicuous consumption stuff, right? Um, especially high levels of conspicuous consumption. Well, there's a few issues with it that we should be really aware of. The first is high levels of conspicuous consumption are often related to high levels of income inequality. You know, we've just said that status is a zero sum game. Um, it's based on the idea that I'm more important than another person and that's how status works, okay? In order for the economy to be structured in such a way that some people are just more important than others, that requires income inequality. And income inequality, as we'll see, and as we have seen, um, creates problems. Secondly, um, the idea that goods and services when they're produced and purchased for social prestige rather than utility is a problem too. Is that, you know, we start thinking of, um, like we start structuring production around prestige all the time, we become more useless over time, I suppose. You know, we start losing our abilities to do things. Okay, so let's imagine the entire economy starts revolving around people who <laughs> We're chasing prestige and I, I'm saying, is it too late? Maybe that's already our economy. It's possible, you know, think really hard. How much time do we spend chasing prestige and status 
how much time do we spend making ourselves better and more productive than we used to be? You know, making the society a better place to live for everybody um, rather than trying to dominate other people through our gains in status. Right? So if social status is a zero sum game, which it is, what that means is that when we spend money on social status, we are causing an economic loss at the very least to some people, right? and we're spending money on raising or lowering our social position, the ultimate result of that is that society is going to lose. Okay, when we invest our money productively, you know, we can argue, yes, maybe that benefits some people more than others, but everybody is still benefiting. Uh, money spent on status only benefits one person and hurts the other person. So it's much worse. So if you're the government and you're worried about conspicuous consumption, uh, what's some examples of some stuff you can do? Well, there are things like luxury taxes. So, you know, we can identify certain goods that are status related goods, you know, expensive cars, expensive clothes, expensive, whatever. And we can stick a tax on them, right? Make them more expensive. And one of the benefits of that is that government gets some revenue too. Okay. As progressive consumption taxes. So if we could somehow record how much people spend on this conspicuous consumption, we could start taxing them more per dollar they spend on conspicuous consumption, right? So the more as a percentage of your budget you spend on this conspicuous consumption, um, we artificially raise the price of those things for you, right? Um, we could also just attack the problem by reducing income inequality. You know, um, if people like the more unequal people's incomes become, um, that raises the ability of some people to show everybody else how much money they've got and lowers the ability of others to show everybody how much money they've got. So any policy that government makes that attacks income inequality, um, economic redistribution would definitely address, I've said fix, but at least address this idea of conspicuous consumption and reduce its impact. So um, irrespective of whether you completely agree with Veblen or not, um, what are some bits of wisdom we can take away from his theory? Well, I think we can agree that capitalism is not always a rational system. Um, there are definite limits to its rationality. Um, and also, it's not always a productive system either. You know, we have a tendency to waste money quite a lot on some pretty stupid things, just chasing status and prestige. All right. Second, that status seeking behavior is strange. Yes, uh, it's weird. It's not productive. There's lots strange about it. But it seems like it's a very important way about the way human societies work. At the very least, it's a problem we've inherited from our past. And it's something we need to think seriously about, well, what are we going to do about status seeking behavior? Just let it exist and let it take over our society? Or do we have to work together in some way through government or through some other instrument to address it and do something about it, you know, to reduce its impact on our society? Thirdly, um, that the economy does not, despite the protests of economics, work in a vacuum, right? The economy is the result of an evolutionary process. It's the result of how our history has shaped our existence today, right? How our society works, the social rules and norms, the customs and culture, right? All of that shapes the decisions that we make. People are not just making decisions as rational economic actors, right? Next, we have to accept that there are some people in our society that just don't contribute very much stuff, right? They don't do much. They don't make contributions, but they still get rewards. And it's kind of amazing, isn't it? You know, in a rational society, you think only the people who produce stuff get rewards, okay? No, not in our society. Uh, some people produce nothing, but still get rewarded for producing nothing. And that's a fascinating thing, right? Thinking about why that happens is really important. Lastly, um, the poor, don't always do what's in their best interests, right? And this is something that Marxists struggle with, I guess, is that, well, if the poor people really realized their best interest, they'd probably be much more aggressive with getting rid of the rich people, okay? But what do we see them doing sometimes? Veblen argues that they copy the rich people. So they're trying to imitate the habits and tastes of the rich people, right? They're sort of communicating um, sometimes to their fellow poor people that they're better than what they actually are as a way of saying, oh, I'm not the worst person. I can feel better about myself because, you know, maybe I'm not at the bottom. You know, a good example of this is that um, irrespective of a person's actual economic position, 
a large number of people who are not anywhere near the middle of society like to call themselves middle class, right? Now, why is that? It's kind of a status thing. Like if you we were talking objectively about your position in the society, maybe you describe yourself differently. But the reason more people say that they're middle class is they want to be in the middle. They don't want to admit that they're at the bottom, right? They don't want to admit they're at the bottom. So status is a major part of how we identify ourselves right? how we identify our own position in the society economically. So that's it for Veblen. Um, and we've talked a lot this week about consumption patterns and the way that people think about consumption and the way that humans um, existence is and how that shapes the way the capitalist system works. You know, Veblen's pretty pe pessimistic about the idea that we can reform the capitalist system in a beneficial way. And next week, we're going to look at uh, Keynes, who's going to say, well, uh, maybe not everything is lost. Maybe through some government intervention, capitalism can be saved. So you've got to decide who you believe. Are we headed for a revolutionary future? Are you a Marxist? You know, um, are we stuck in this permanent chase for status? Do you follow Veblen? You know, or do you think capitalism can be stabilized through the government? Are you following Keynes? That's the big thing to think about in the next little while. Thanks everybody for listening.